So thanks very much for this opportunity uh, to share our research. I'll be presenting on behalf of myself and our colleagues. And to start, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So for today's presentation, I'll be covering these five topics. First, I'll introduce you to the complement system, uh, just as a refresher from Dr. Brodsky's introduction, and evidence for its role in COVID-19. And then next, I'll describe the objectives of our studies, as well as their design. I'll share with you our findings about complement activation in the blood of patients with severe COVID-19, which tells us about both the type and degree of complement activation in vivo. And then I'll share some findings of our in vitro studies of complement. So what happens to cells that are exposed to the blood of COVID-19 patients? Lastly, I'll discuss the implications, limitations, and how we plan to move forward with these studies. So complement is, as Dr. Brodsky had mentioned in his talk, a proteolytic cascade that is part of the innate immune system. It acts as a first line of defense against injury and infection to both alert and recruit immune cells and neutralize pathogens. Complement can be activated through three interrelated pathways, the lectin, classical, and alternative. The lectin pathway can be triggered primarily through the recognition of carbohydrates on the surface of microbial cells. The classical pathway is primarily triggered by pathogen-bound antibodies. And the alternative pathway is always somewhat active due to the spontaneous hydrolysis of C3 to a C3B-like molecule. And it also acts as an amplification loop for all three pathways and is considered the most biologically active. So activation of these three pathways triggers the formation of C3 convertase complexes that begin generating C3B. And C3B binds to the targeted cell membrane to facilitate leukocyte adhesion and phagocytosis. Some C3B is incorporated into C3 convertases, which shifts their substrate specificity from C3 to C5. These C5 convertase complexes generate C5A and C5B. And C5A is a very potent anaphylatoxin that triggers increased vascular permeability, localized endothelial cell degranulation, and leukocyte chemotaxis. C5B binds to the cell membrane, acting as the nucleus for formation of the membrane attack complex, which is a multi-protein complex that inserts into the cell membrane with the goal of killing the targeted cell. And infected, damaged, or apoptotic cells can become the target of complement, which can lead to catastrophic tissue damage if it is pathologically activated or improperly regulated. So the mechanisms through which complement is activated by SARS-CoV-2 infection are unclear, but some studies have found elevated complement activation markers in the blood of COVID-19 patients that increase with disease severity. Large amounts of activated complement proteins have been found in the lungs, kidneys, and liver of patients who succumb to COVID-19. And in vitro studies have demonstrated that the closely related SARS-CoV nucleocapsid protein can bind to MASP2, triggering activation through the lectin pathway. And as we heard about earlier, in October of last year, Dr. Brodsky's group showed that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein contributes to elevated alternative pathway activity, potentially by interfering with its regulation by factor H. So, when we first set out to study complement in COVID-19, there was very little information uh, about complement activation throughout hospitalization and which pathways were involved. The objectives of our study were to characterize the involvement of each of the three complement activation pathways. Next, we sought to track the changes in complement activation pathways throughout the ICU stay of critically ill patients. Lastly, we sought to determine whether a patient's complement status at the time of ICU admission correlated with their respiratory status and whether or not it could be used to predict survivorship. And at the same time, 
we wanted to characterize the extent of complement-mediated endothelial cell injury and activation in vitro and identify potential therapeutic targets. In part one, we studied 25 critically ill patients admitted to Vancouver General Hospital between March and May of 2020. Blood was taken from an existing arterial line after written informed consent was obtained for up to 21 days post ICU admission. And in comparison, 25 general population healthy controls were analyzed. So complement analytes were assayed by commercial ELISA kits and compared to clinical measurements of both respiratory status and kidney function. In part two, we layered serum from critically ill COVID-19 patients and healthy controls onto endothelial cells and measured complement attack by immunofluorescence microscopy. So activation of the terminal pathway yields soluble cleavage products that can be used to estimate the degree of activation in the blood. So for example, C5A circulates freely until it binds its receptors, two of which are found on endothelial cells, and these events trigger inflammatory and adhesive changes to the endothelium. When we assayed C5A in the serum of COVID-19 patients, we saw a nine-fold median increase compared to healthy controls. Activation of the terminal pathway also produces C5B, and C5B can be formed in solution, and if it fails to insert into a cell membrane, it circulates as a soluble form. So like C5A, we saw a five-fold median increase in SC5B9 in this cohort of critically ill COVID-19 patients. Activation of the alternative pathway through either the constitutively active hydrolyzed C3 or through the C3B amplification loop also yields soluble products that can be used as pathway-specific indicators of complement activation. We found that the BA fragment pictured on the left was significantly elevated in COVID-19 patients at the time of ICU admission. Similarly, the BB molecule, which is pictured on the right, was significantly increased in COVID-19 patients. So when we compared complement markers to various clinical measurements, we observed a very strong positive correlation between serum BA and serum creatinine. Creatinine is a metabolic waste product that is normally rapidly cleared from circulation by the kidneys, and high creatinine is indicative of renal dysfunction. Similarly, BA is also primarily cleared from circulation by the kidneys, so we wanted to know if elevated circulating BA was simply a product of renal dysfunction or indicative of pathological activation of the alternative pathway. So when we stratified patients based on their serum creatinine with less than 100 considered normal and greater than 100 considered abnormal, we saw that the patients with normal creatinine still had elevated BA compared to healthy controls, which was even higher in patients who had high creatinine. So this suggests that the elevated BA is due in part to alternative pathway activation in vivo and is even higher in patients with kidney dysfunction. The rate of alternative pathway activation and amplification is limited by the enzyme factor D. Circulating factor D increases in response to various inflammatory states and can further potentiate complement activation. High circulating factor D is a feature of kidney disease and is associated with a variety of vascular inflammatory diseases. We found that a subset of patients had elevated factor D, which likely contributes to the magnitude of complement activation in these individuals. As we heard about earlier, one of the primary regulators of complement that can shut off the alternative pathway is factor H. Factor H attenuates complement activation through three mechanisms. It prevents formation of the C3 convertase complex. It increases the dissociation rate of the C3 convertase complex. And lastly, it acts as a cofactor for factor I to inactivate C3B to IC3B. And surprisingly, we found that factor H was significantly lower in patients compared to controls, which could be a contributing factor 
in the heightened activity of the alternative pathway in these patients. But currently, the cause of this effect is unclear. We also assayed the C4B degradation product, C4D, which is generated by both the classical and lectin pathways. And we found that there was variable activation of these pathways in this cohort. So these findings are particularly significant to the use of anti-complement therapeutics. We and other groups have seen that it is the alternative pathway that is the most and consistently active, suggesting that therapeutics targeting the alternative pathway could be the most useful. When we correlated circulating complement analytes to respiratory status on the same day that blood samples were taken, we found that alternative pathway analytes BB and BA and the terminal pathway analytes C5A were significantly associated with the severity of hypoxemia. We had previously seen that the inflammatory cytokine IL-6 was also associated with hypoxemia, and the strength of this relationship was similar to what we observed with these complement analytes. Next, we examined complement activation longitudinally in a subset of patients. We found that the alternative and terminal pathway markers remained elevated over the entire 21-day study period, and these values were well above the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval of the control cohort. So activation marker BA remained chronically elevated, BB remained chronically elevated, factor D remained reasonably stable, and factor H remained reasonably stable. So we saw a tr similar trend with the terminal pathway analytes SC5B9, as well as with C5A. So interestingly, we saw some fluctuations in these markers that appeared to align with the corticosteroid treatment of these patients, or with the administration of the anti-IL-6 antibody, tocilizumab. This trend of persistent elevation was representative of the entire cohort, and these findings were in stark contrast to our previous study of acute phase, acute phase markers of inflammation. So for example, longitudinal analyses of IL-6 showed that it spikes extremely high and then rapidly falls almost immediately before worsening respiratory failure and death. Whereas in survivors, IL-6 tends to steadily decrease as patients recover. So as a result, the dynamic range of complement analytes throughout their ICU stay was substantially smaller than the acute phase markers. So this observation could have particular significance for post-acute COVID-19, as complement was still hyperactive in many patients at the time that they were discharged from the ICU. So given their persistent elevation, we found that both the concentrations of the BA fragment and factor D at the time of ICU admission showed utility in predicting mortality in the following 30 days. The odds of dying increased fourfold on average for every one unit increase in BA or factor D in this cohort. And these values were comparable to other known risk factors such as obesity and diabetes. So shifting gears, what about in vitro? What happens to endothelial cells incubated with serum from these patients? And second, can these effects be attenuated by inhibiting various complement components? We measured complement attack using a fluorescence-based antibody detection system for the C5B9 complex. The first important observation from these studies is that despite the activation of complement components in vivo, patient sera retain their complement activity, and some even deposit huge amounts of C5B9 onto endothelial cells. This occurred without sensitizing the cells to complement attack, suggesting there's something in the serum of COVID-19 patients that either enhances or dysregulates C5B9 formation. And COVID has been suggested to be a two-hit disease in that an initial insult, such as systemic vascular infl inflammation due to a viral infection, sensitizes the cells to complement attack, which propagates a vicious cycle of tissue damage. So understanding why this is happening is a keystone of our current research. And we found that despite whatever agents 
are in COVID-19 patient serum that are sensitizing these cells to complement. It can be shut off simply by blocking complement. So first we looked at the level of complement protein C3. When we measured opsonization of endothelial cells by C3B, we found that it was similar between COVID-19 patients and healthy controls, with some patients actually showing far less C3B deposition than the controls. This could be effectively obliterated by blocking the conversion of C3 to C3B or also by blocking the formation of the C3B BB convertase complex. However, this varies widely between donors based on circulating C3 levels. So in our hands, blocking complement deposition at the level of C3 appears to be more effective in the COVID-19 patients, which we presume are somewhat C3 depleted due to chronic in vivo activation of complement. And a similar inhibitory effect can be seen in experiments probing for C5B9. We know that some patients have elevated factor D, which again is the rate limiting enzyme of complement amplification, which could be potentiating greater activation in some of these patients. So if we target the amplification loop of complement by blocking factor D, we can obliterate both C3B and C5B9 deposition onto endothelial cells. So you can see in the top right panel, there's a small amount of detectable C3B being deposited, but it does not amplify into the massive patches of green seen in the image on the top left. So this has the downstream effect on inhibiting C5B9 formation. So these data share some parallels with our ELISA data in a couple of different ways. Firstly, it was the split products of the alternative pathway, BA and BB, that were significantly correlated with the severity of hypoxemia in COVID-19. And second, it was elevated BA and factor D that conveyed an increased odds of death in COVID-19. So why this is the case is not clear yet, but it may have to do with the reliance of both the lectin and classical pathways on the alternative pathway to amplify complement activation. The three arms of the complement cascade funnel toward factor D dependent generation of massive amounts of C3, which then leads to downstream C5B9 generation. So how is complement mediated endothelial cell attack related to COVID-19? Some things are known about the endothelial cell response in COVID-19, such as an increase in circulating tissue factor bearing microparticles, and increased circulating markers of endothelial cell activation. Our main goal going forward is to figure out what this increase in complement attack on endothelium is doing to these cells, particularly looking at procoagulant and prothrombotic changes to the vascular endothelium. So our main question is what portion of the endothelial cell response is complement mediated? And can we attenuate this simply by blocking complement? So in summary, we found that elevated serum BA and factor D at ICU admission are associated with an increased odds of death. Alternative pathway activation is associated with the severity of hypoxemia in COVID-19. Complement activation remains elevated throughout the ICU, of the ICU stay of these patients and layering COVID-19 serum onto endothelial cells uh, significantly enhances C5B9 deposition. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank the institutions and funding agencies that facilitated this work. I also thank my supervisors for their guidance and support, as well as the many collaborators we have on this project. I also thank the patient and healthy blood donors, as well as the healthcare workers who collected the blood and looked after these patients. Thanks for listening. I'd be happy to take your questions. So I have a couple of questions for you while we're waiting for other people to put their hands up. I'm just curious, as, as you will know full well, C3 is an acute phase reactant and yes. these are very sick patients. And I'm wondering if you have, if you measured the baseline levels of C3 in, in, the, in the patients. We haven't. So there have been some groups that have measured C3A and seen that it's activated, which is expected. In terms of C3, um, it already circulates at a really high concentration Use the mic, use the mic, use the mic, sure.
So we know that C3 already circulates at an extremely high concentration at about, uh, in healthy individuals, between five and eight micromolar. In terms of whether or not it would be elevated in, in response to COVID-19, I don't know that anyone's looked at that. But yeah, as I, as I mentioned, uh, C3A is definitely very high. And there, have, there has been another group that has used C3A successfully to, to, in a biomarker study of their own, showing that it's associated with an increased odds of mortality as well. And then my other question for you is, you, you do see quite high levels of, of SC5B9. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether at the same time, do you see any any um, red cell hemolysis occurring in these in the samples that you're collecting? Have you looked at? Mm -hmm. Have you looked for that? Yep. So the the samples that we get are from our collaborators at the Brain and Mind Institute, um, as well as from VGH. So some of the samples uh, you can tell that there's a clear pink or red hue that there has been hemolysis that's been going on and we've noted that but we haven't seen a significant trend any direction or another in terms of the samples that appear hemolyzed versus the ones that aren't okay thanks other questions oh yeah hi um great talk um just a quick question maybe you've covered it in the background and i have missed it in terms of um, activating the complement regarding other viruses like MERS, is that really specific to COVID? And seems that um, some of the factors are predictive of survival. Is it also very specific to COVID or has it always been like that? Thanks. Thanks very much for the question. So we've been thinking about this a lot over the last year. Um, oftentimes we've gotten similar questions in is, let's say someone with non-COVID ARDS, what's their complement profile? The goal of our work so far hasn't necessarily been to say that complement is a COVID specific response. Rather, uh, we're interested in complement activation in severe disease in general and understanding more about how complement plays a role in uh, diseases that involve, let's say, acute lung injury or systemic vascular inflammation. So it really goes beyond COVID uh, in terms of our, our end goals. It's, it's more thinking more broadly. But to date, we haven't compared uh, any, any other cohorts. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. I have another question. What? Okay. Uh, good. Ha ha. Good, good talk, Alex. Uh, I have a question from our friend and colleague, uh, Tyler Smith, who would like to know if uh, you also compared these to any uh, other acutely unwell patients other than, other than COVID. That's a, a really great question. And we've seen some studies of COVID-19 patients who have used ICU controls. Uh, and they tend to be all over the place because people are in the ICU for various reasons. And they're they're really heterogeneous. The, the advantage of looking at COVID versus healthy controls compared to other groups is that if there is more of a, a subtle difference, you can really see um, the effect size better. And you can also really focus on the heterogeneity of the COVID population rather than just seeing a spread of overlapping values for every endpoint and, and having a lot more trouble making sense of it. Thanks.